Today we're gonna talk about all of the specific and weird type of jobs that people did in ancient Rome. I don't know how appropriate this video is gonna be for kids, so close the door. Rome was a multi-ethnic society with a large population that required a broad spectrum of jobs to sustain its economy. However, choosing their career was not always an option for the general people. This was only possible for people with higher status or inherited roles. Prestigious professions, military leadership and political administration were reserved for the Roman upper class, whereas ordinary people were involved in various jobs. Moreover, the Roman Empire depended on slaves and any wealthy person could keep as many as 500 slaves. The Choosing your career is actually a modern thing because people were forced to do a specific type of labor for probably since the world begins just because they need to survive and because of heritage and the sick ambitions of the parents. The slaves were controlled such that they had to partake in challenging unpleasant works of low esteem. The typical jobs were farming, construction and domestic services and educated slaves could work in medicine, teaching, accounting and artists. Now as a pharmacist I would say that I'm an educated slave. Some jobs however like the orgy planner or urine collector were bizarre even to the slaves. So today we will take a look at the weird Roman job. The weirder a job is the higher it is ranked on the list while more normal jobs are ranked lower. Oh, Why were they collecting urine? Ah, For medical purposes. Let's start off the F tier with a job that actually still exists today, even though it may have changed slightly. Just like our astrologists who try to predict your future by your zodiac sign or tarot cards, the ancient Romans had their own version of that profession. You're a Gemini, you probably experienced deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before. And you also experienced deja vu, the feeling that this moment has happened before. The Polarius were chicken interpreters who told the fortune of military campaigns based on how chickens ate. Instead of being tasked with taking care of more regal birds like eagles or owls, the Polarius had to take care of sacred military chickens. Sacred military chickens. One Imagine how, how exciting this job was, sitting all day like this. Man, the chicken is gonna eat after 5 hours, what am I gonna do now? One of the strongest empires in history literally had chickens that were relied on to tell whether a battle would go well or not for the Roman army. Before a battle, a Polarius would release the chickens and throw corn on the ground. If the chickens ate, all was well. If they ate so messily they dropped kernels, even better. If they didn't eat, oh no. If they refused to come out of their cages, you may as well send everyone home. There even is a story about one Roman fleet commander who was so impatient with the poor birds who were understandably dizzy from sailing, not wanting to come out of their cage that he threw them overboard. He lost the battle and was scolded for drowning his fleet's sacred war chickens. I th it's because of the chickens he lost the battle, N no doubt about that. This profession perfectly defines the F tier. It is somewhat strange, but considering that we still do the same thing today, it's kind of normal at least for this list. Yeah, superstitious people everywhere, always. We all know it and we all hate it. You are at a party and someone approaches you, but damn you forgot their name, which could result in embarrassment. Sucks for you, but the Romans were perfectly prepared for such a situation. The Roman profession of name caller or nomenclator had one simple task, to remember everyone's name at a party or other event. As efficient as the Romans were, they had a backup for not remembering people's names at gatherings and parties, saving themselves from embarrassment. When so, you forget someone's name and then you have to call another person to tell you that person's name and if that person forgets it, he needs to call his assistant. That's And the person, of course, that... Uh, got his name forgotten is already insulted. When people would approach their masters, the nomenclator would loudly announce the name of whoever would come, saving a deadly social embarrassment. What sounds like a funny party gimmick at first was actually also a crucial political instrument. Political candidates would be accompanied by their respective nomenclators, who prevented any embarrassment for the candidate. Whenever someone would approach the candidates in a friendly or personal manner, they would ensure the candidate by calling out the approaching person's name out loud. So what happens if you forget the name? Tier, since it isn't really weird, but the nomenclature man is gonna die probably. 
punishment. The last candidate for the F tier is the position of Vestal Virgins. In ancient Rome, the Vestals were known to be the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and were considered vital to the security of Rome. The duty of the Vestals was to keep the fire in the temple of Vesta burning. They believed that the failure to do so would lead to chaos in the empire. It was essential for the Romans that the Vestals were virgins. You might touch the finish line, but you've never touched a woman. You're right. That's actually not an easy task. If you have ever tried to keep a fire up and running for 24 hours, you would know. Not that I have, but I know. I haven't lost my virginity. This was obviously a drawback and a risk at the same time. If they were to lose their virginity, they were usually walled alive and then left to dehydrate, a truly brutal punishment. Other Vestals who broke any other vow, such as letting the temple fire go out, were beaten behind a curtain in the dark. However, the good in all this was that they were treated fairly well and given special game seats. So all in all, I would consider this job to be quite normal, especially considering that even modern monks and nuns still vow to abstain from any sexual activity. Although luckily, the punishments today aren't nearly as harsh. It did sound normal for ancient Rome. Now we enter the E tier with a rather interesting but kind of controversial job. In the ancient world, a funeral clown was common enough to leave behind records of clowns making fun of the dead at their own funerals. These funeral clowns would mimic the behavior of the deceased. It wasn't just any behavior either, they specifically picked ones that made the deceased look bad. Of course, this was done in a funny way that wouldn't offend the audience, which was likely made up of friends and family who wouldn't tolerate actual slant. As always, that's another reason why people hate clowns. They are disgusting. One amusing account from Suetonius, a Roman historian, tells of a funeral clown mocking Vespasian, the emperor famous for his role in building the Colosseum, for his stinginess. The funeral clown was said to have asked the crowd, while still pretending to be Vespasian, how much the funeral would cost him. Considering that most of our modern death rituals are connected with immense grief, this might seem weird to many of you, However, I think the concept that a dead person gives his friends and relatives one last laugh through one of these clowns doesn't sound too bad. The concept is good, I agree, but this doesn't make it moral, it's disgusting. The clowns are disgusting people, not the people themselves, just the... anyway. DISGUSTING! In ancient Rome, asking the gods for help was common if one could not personally take revenge. A curse against their enemies was ordered by the hateful and the superstitious. The middlemen between the gods and the hateful person were called cursed tablet scribes. The entire day they would hear people's complaints of hate for others and the wrongdoings they had endured. They would take people's requests for revenge and etch a curse onto a soft lead plate. Those cursed tablets were believed to have influential power against the gods and they would either be nailed to the wall of temples or rolled up, placed underground in graves or thrown into wells or lakes. No, man. All manners of cruel punishments consisting of blindness, madness and hopes of the enemy's intestines being eaten away would be wished for in those curses. The treatment done to the material was compared to what should be done to the target of the spell. The curses would be written backward if needed to be extra effective. That's definitely a weird custom, but... Uh, custom, that's superstitious. Harry Potterish and dump. It's totally dump. Why are people so superstitious that someone has to die and be cursed and get blinded? Considering nowadays people use fake Twitter accounts to insult other people, this concept doesn't seem too far Yeah, <laughs> and fake Facebook accounts. Now we are coming into the D tier featuring the Fuller. Fulling is the process of cleaning clothes, especially wool, to remove oils, dirt and other impurities and make them thicker. Ancient Roman times were popular for fulling by making the slaves stand ankle deep in the urine. As filthy as it sounds, the practicality of the concept lies in the fact that urine was a source of ammonium salts. It was known as the wash that assisted in cleansing and whitening clothes. The use of urine faded when more sophisticated concepts of water mills came into place. The job itself was Imagine basically the a very smell. early form of someone doing laundry, which isn't weird at all. However, the part where you have to stand in ankle-deep urine makes this whole thing relatively unpleasant, I would imagine. However, urine was actually so important in ancient Rome that they even had official urine tax collectors who, spoiler, will be featured later on this list. 
Another candidate for this tier is the position of armpit hair plucker. Armpit hair pluckers filled bathhouses with the screams of their clients. Roman baths were hubs of public life and of public image. One of the many services offered at the baths was armpit plucking employed by bathhouse guilds to manually pluck the armpit hairs of patrons with tweezers. The f I had no clue that people back then were plucking their hairs. It was a sign of manliness to have hairs. Now we know that having hair under your armpits or somewhere else, I'm not gonna mention it. Uh, it reduces the hygiene and it's good to remove them. Of course, it's not mandatory if it will make you feel feminine or masculine to have them or not have them, keep them as well. The philosopher Seneca notes that the armpit pluckers would shout in the bathhouses to get people to get their pits plucked. And when the pit plucker wasn't shouting, he was forcing his customer to shriek instead of him. Honestly, this job was pretty normal considering that armpit waxing isn't out of the ordinary even today. However, I think that turning this waxing process into a public event at the bathhouse makes it a little weirder than it needed to be. It's like a show. Now we enter the C tier, the perfect middle ground between somewhat normal jobs that are also pretty weird. Vicarious were the middle managers between their masters and their fellow slaves. And yeah, we're literally talking about real middle manager slaves who managed other slaves. It just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Ooh, it's the first Someone level of management. College. According to Vicky Leon, author of Working 9th to V, slave owners would buy slaves to serve as their body doubles at work and do their work for them. These vicarious would then be lived vicariously. By That's how the, the management model be became realistic by hiring middlemen slaves and then hiring more slaves to delegate work to them and at the end if someone's gonna get punished it's not gonna be you it's gonna be some other slave by their owners who would send them to do office work it wasn't so bad of a gig either since why am i so happy when i say this given access to part or all of their master's assets some of them would be paid a portion of the profits made allowing them to eventually buy their freedoms Ironically, more enterprising slaves, however, would opt to buy their own vicarious and continue growing their master's wealth so they could continue taking a cut. So while this management position isn't far off from modern businesses, the ancient slaves aspect makes that job very questionable. Yeah, I'm not gonna say this we out loud. We finally enter the B tier with the job everyone has been looking forward to, the Roman orgy planner. The planners were responsible for planning the perfect orgies and sex parties where guests freely partake in open and unrestrained sexual activities, including group sex. They had the authority to select the food, drinks and music, as well as women. Those women could attend the orgy who were capable of making the event of utmost entertainment for the guests. The Greco-Roman world shared the party god Bacchus, lord of wine and ritual madness, and celebrated him with the Bacchanalia. Attendance of these parties had a tendency to really tap into that divine crazy party energy and go around on a debauched, often violent sex spree. At one orgy, legendary bisexual Alcibiades, an Athenian statesman and his homies, stole the dicks of hundreds of statues throughout Athens. However, the planners were despised, especially by the lower class, as they thought the entire event to be unnecessarily luxurious and expensive, or simply because they didn't get an invite themselves. All in all, the job must have been really funny, but I think I don't even have to explain why this job description might seem weird to some people. Weird, this is why Rome burned! Shit collector. Now that's the perfect we start job. Off the A tier with the position of Stercorarius, or to say it more bluntly, the shit collector. That is one big pile of shit. What Ancient are they Rome gonna was do famous with this for shit? its aqueducts and toilets, innovations that were so advanced it would take centuries to see them return after the fall of Rome. What a lot of people forget is that a lot of these advanced services were available only for important public buildings. Think of the noisy bathhouse where the armpit plucker is trying to pluck your pits or government buildings, regular residential areas where most people lived, not on the plumbing grid. That's why the Stercorarius had to go from house to house and collect people's shit from their cesspools, bucket by bucket and wagon by wagon. Nice. He then had to drag all everybody's shit outside the city where he would sell it to farmers. For his troubles, the Stercorarius got 11 copper coins. Considering Rome's bumpy stone streets, it wasn't a rare occurrence for one of these shit wagons. So you go, you go to collect shit, you get paid to collect it, 
then you sell it to someone else and you get more money from people's poop. Now that's a job. To literally flood the Sturkerarius. So considering you were basically a personified toilet flush, this job was one of the weirder ones. Urine tax collector. That's even the better. The urine tax collector was basically the big brother of the shit collector. As introduced by Emperor Nero, the urine tax was subsequently taken upon by his son Titus. Urine was widely used in various chemical processes, such as extracting ammonia to clean and whiten clothes, soaking animal skin before tanning, and even using it as toothpaste. If I was to choose a job out of that tier, I would choose the, the urine tax collector. <laughs> the urine would be summoned from public toilets and cesspools. When the finances of the Roman Empire had been crippled after nearly two years of civil war, Vespasian inherited the empire and left his successor with urine. a profit through the urine tax collection from the urine gathered at public restrooms. Look how happy the, this guy is very happy with his job. He enjoys it very much. When Titus Vespasian's son blamed his father for applying the tax on urine, he held a piece of gold coin procured from the tax against his nose and replied, money does not stink. The ultimate giga chat. The position of the whipping boy was exactly as cruel as it sounds. The education of the royal children faced some difficulty in the 15th century as education was enforced through punishments. The divine right of kings that stated God and the king's son appointed the kings was to be punished by no one, but the king brought the tutors into a dilemma. Hence, as a solution, the appointment of whipping boys was established. Another boy studying with the king's son appointed by his son would be punished if he misbehaved or did not do his homework. Stay still! In return, the whipping boy was granted noble titles and estates for his service once he... So, you have to sacrifice your child to go study with the king's child? But then your child is gonna get educated in return of a little bit of beating every single day and uh, the mental trauma that's gonna last for the rest of his life. That, that's hard. Hard choice. An adult. The idea behind this was the hope of developing a bond between the two, leading to the royal infant behaving and studying well to end the whipping boy's misery. So while this job could provide you with titles and other rewards, it must be a horrible feeling to get a bloody punishment for the mistakes a stuck-up child of the royal family made. Well, the last job was very controversial and I do not know how effective it is. But anyway, what job would you choose to do in ancient Rome? I already chose mine, urine tax collector. With this said also, don't forget to subscribe and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!